Hello and welcome to Office Hours in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. I'm Brent Ozar and I'll be answering your questions about Microsoft SQL Server uh, while sitting here watching the sunset. You can't see the sunset, it's over there, but if I point it at the, point the camera over there, uh, then you won't be able to see anything because it's kind of bright here. Um, I love the, so I don't know that I've ever shown you all the beach down here. This isn't really a swimmable beach. You're not supposed to swim here. This is the ocean and it's the southern tip of the Baja Peninsula. If you swim, it's really easy to get taken off via the currents and go straight into the Sea of Cortez. People die here every, every year trying to uh, swim. So no one's allowed to go into the water here. Every now and then you see somebody do it and uh, the locals go running out after them going, you know, no, you need to get your rear end back in here. So let's go take a look uh, at your questions. Let's see, first up we have Rojo, which means red in Spanish, but I don't think that's what he meant. Rojo says, please comment on the cloud. Could you be more generic? Too, there's too much push at my company to do the cloud without the backing to do so. There are lots of issues and costs or delays to get there. The supposed seem, savings seem non-existent. It's less performant. We already own SQL Server, so renting a new location seems like a waste. Okay. Okay. So the thing that I always ask people is, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And you, you should ask that of anyone who says, we want to go to the cloud. Say, okay, what's the problem that you're trying to solve by doing that? You know, what, what do you think is going to be different? Um, and then if they say it's something like cost savings, go, oh, okay, show me. Let's see how that, you know, lines up. What does it look like? Um, and then do a proof of concept. Be open to doing a proof of concept with them and show them what performance is like. There are plenty of legit reasons to go to the cloud, including cost savings. And for example, one of my clients, the leases were approaching their ends on their data centers. They didn't have a whole lot more time left on their leases. And the data center vendors wanted to jack up the prices, so it made more cost-effective sense for them to go up to the cloud. Um, plus, they were trying to move towards software as a service uh, type providers anyway, like having other people do a lot of the hosting for them. Um, so there are cases where it saves money. There are cases where you get better performance if you re-architect applications. But the thing I think a lot of people just assume is that they're going to be able to lift and shift their infrastructure uh, directly to the cloud and have it be faster and cheaper, and that's just not the case. Uh, next up, Lotka asks, Hi Brent, my coworker has SP who is active logging to a table every 30 seconds. Is this an acceptable amount of observer overhead? Um, I, I would ask them why every 30 seconds and why not every 60 seconds or every five minutes. Um, the other thing you could do is you could look at tools like SP Blitz Cache to, to actually see the overhead that it's causing. Um, just make sure to pick your battles. Uh, if the server isn't that stressed out and the person wants to do it, just let them. Just know that you can't really trust their, their intuition on anything else. Or uh, modernize their skills. Modernize their skills so that they do something better. Like looking at performance via weight stats and then analyzing the plan cache to understand, or query store, to understand which queries are grouped together causing the most overhead. My guess, if they're doing SP who is active every 30 seconds, is that they probably always worked for a company that never had any money for training or for tools and they don't know the overhead of it or the server's just bored. I mean, I, I see a lot of people who uh, just err on the side of overhead, just continuously polling things or hoarding data. I see people who just hoard data. They're like, you never know when this is going to come in handy. I'm like, okay, bless your heart. You know, let me... The other thing you can do is sit and go, hey, there was a performance problem last night at, you know, whatever time it was. Can you show me how you use that table in order to diagnose the root cause? And maybe they're a wizard with it. Maybe they've been doing it for like 10 years. It smells bad to me though. I'm less worried about the observer overhead and I'm more just worried about them not getting to the right conclusion. 
Next up, Dan asks, uh, we have an archive database that's growing in size. We were going to look at row or page compression, but the systems engineers said that with our pure or NetApp flash storage that all compression is done at the SAN level. What are your thoughts? As you'll often hear me, this is going to be a theme, I guess, in this week's episode. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Okay, the database is large. What are you going to solve with page or row compression? If you're worried about the space that's taken up on the storage, then the storage people are correct. If you're worried about the time it takes to do a restore or a backup, then I would probably look at other solutions instead of page or row compression. For example, good old backup compression or switching to snapshot backups because both of those storage devices, both Pure and NetApp, support snapshot backups that work really well with SQL Server. So think more about what the problem is that you're trying to solve and then the most efficient way of solving that. I will say I've never had a case where implementing row or page compression was the last solution where I went, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's all gather together here. We're going to put on compression. And then all of a sudden people went, oh, you know, like it was a choir in the background. Um, it's, I've also, at the same time, I've never had to tell anyone to take it out. I've never had to say someone, uh, okay, listen, everyone, I've gathered you together because we need to remove page and row compression. It's really important. There are times when that happens. Uh, Paul Randall's SQL Skills newsletter, uh, their insider's newsletter, recently talked about a case where uh, if you're repeatedly uncompressing data that lives in RAM, that it can cause a CPU hit because it's compressed data that's stored in RAM too as well. And I always forget about that. Uh, so if you had queries that were continuously scanning the same pages, decompressing them every time, you could see a CPU increase by enabling row or page compression. So just make sure you know what problem you're trying to solve. Next up, we have Dan Griswold. <laughs> Dan Griswold says, uh, that could even be his real name, but Clark Griswold is what I immediately thought of. Mm. Dan says, do you know of any gotchas when upgrading a SQL Server to a new version and then running the old database in uh, old compatibility mode. I'm concerned about, or I'm considering using this method. No, I do this all the time. I do this constantly. In fact, that's what I recommend to anybody anytime that they upgrade SQL Server. Uh, keep it on the old database compatibility level for at least a couple of weeks uh, so that when people blame, they go, oh my God, there's a problem with the new, uh, with the new database uh, server version, then, then you can know that it's not really related to the compat level switch. Otherwise, if you both upgrade SQL Server and you change the compat level at the same time, ooh, there's some big waves coming through here, uh, and you change uh, compat level at exactly the same time, uh, then you don't know which one is the, the cause for concern, because changing compat levels does change your execution plans pretty dramatically. Uh, Desi asks, I'm seeing too many sleeping connections in SQL Server from my application. Can this be a cause of concern? Uh, generally speaking, no. I don't think that I've seen that in years. Um, no, I'm going to go with no. I, I, I think you're probably barking up the wrong tree there. I wouldn't worry about that as a major concern for me. Is it possible if we're talking tens of thousands of sleeping connections? Sure, it would lead me to question whether or not the app is using connection pooling correctly. But if they're just sleeping and you've got 10,000 open connections, I'm like, ah, I don't, I don't know that that would be the first place I'd go look for something. Next up, Gustav says, thank you for the highly informative office hour sessions. Oh, you're welcome. The sun rises are an additional bonus, he says. Will there be a Watch Brent Code stream at some point considering your schedule? Those are great to watch. How you tackle a challenge that needs to be addressed. So for those, I save those for my mastering classes. 
Uh, in my mastering classes, I do things like fixing uh, code in stored procedures, uh, fixing code that's unparameterized and so forth. I just happened to finish my mastering parameter sniffing class today. Uh, so that, that is why it's so fresh in my mind. Um, but for the coding, I tend to do those as part of my paid training classes. Um, it's not to say I wouldn't do it. It's just that, you know, why not do this? <laughs> if I have the choice between doing something, I'm going to probably do this. Uh, next up, Hatsun asks, does parameterizing a top, like select top at max rows, contribute to any potential query performance problems? Yes, uh, it just so happens that we have an exercise on that in mastering parameter sniffing. Um, if you search for that thing, parameterize top, and Eric Darling, Eric with a K, E-R-I-K Darling, um, Eric has a blog post about that on ericdarlingdata.com where he, he's got like four of them actually, he's got a series of like four blog posts. Seriously, people actually catch stuff here, it's kind of bananas. A uh, big, big fish, well, 50, 60 pound fish. Uh, I've seen people catch right off here off the shore just like that, it's pretty nuts. Um, so yeah, search for Eric Darling, parameterization top, and that'll, that should uh, get you started there. Next up, Frank asks, Frank Poncherello asks, that's such a cool last name, Poncherello asks, is, Brent, is Resource Governor ever a good traffic cop? for a busy multi-tenant OLTP system with a multi-terabyte database. So the thing you have to understand about Resource Governor is that it makes queries slower. Resource Governor makes queries slower. That's what it does. If you have a burning need to make queries slower, if you have a burning need to take away CPU resources, memory, uh, then sure, Resource Governor can be a great fit. But generally speaking, when someone says their database is busy, I don't get a lot of people going, Brent, that's a great idea. Let's make some of the queries slower because it can exacerbate locking problems. It can exacerbate the space that's taken up in TempDB for long running transactions or even reads. Uh, so I, not, I don't really see that as a great solution for OLTP. Now, somebody in the YouTube comments is going to be like, well, Brent, you know, if people were running reports against the transactional system, you could make sure that the reports don't get too much resources. And I'm like, well, yeah, but when you start talking about multi-terabyte databases, you're probably running reports on an availability group secondary or in a data warehouse anyway. You don't really want to run live reporting on a, a transactional OLTP database on the same server as production. And even if you do, slowing those queries down probably isn't a great answer either because people are already probably pissed off about performance on those. <coughs> I'm like, going to be sarcastic here, but career pro tip, try to make people's queries faster instead of slower. Follow me, like, and subscribe for more tips. Uh, next. <coughs> Trash my voice for that. That's karma there. Um, Amit asks, oh wow, that's good. Amit's a great question. Amit says, do you know of a good page that shows the new features by SQL Server version? Yes. It's so funny. This is gonna sound like self-promotion. Um, but if you search for Brent Ozar, which SQL Server version, Brent Ozar, which SQL Server version should I use? I break down the most important new features by version so that when you're making a choice between versions, uh, and I'm, I'm really only hitting the, sh the big sh uh, showpiece, showcase features. Um, there are lots of tiny little baby features, but I'm really focusing on the big ones. Uh, so search for Brent Ozar, which SQL Server version should I use? Next up, Nadim says, we sometimes see high disk IO utilization for one of our 15 SAN drives, but we're not sure which of the queries are driving the IO. 
is there a good way to determine which queries are targeting tables for a given SAN drive for a given point in time? Ooh, this is tricky. So can I give you an answer quickly in a webcast like this? No. I do cover this in my Mastering Server Tuning class. In my Mastering Server Tuning class, I tell you how to identify your SQL Server's bottlenecks. And in the case of uh, page I.O. latch weights, which would be the top bottleneck for reading data from, reading uncached data from a data file. Um, then I show you how to find the queries that are causing that, find the indexes that are involved with that and more. So that's in my Mastering Server Tuning class. If you want to check that out, specifically hop to the Page I.O. Latch Weights module. Uh, next up, Mike asks, Hi Brent, what are your thoughts regarding on-premises SQL Server backup to Azure storage functionality? Are there any issues with it? There are many. Uh, the, the first problem that you run into is your throughput across the network. Since you are charged for, ingre or for uh, uh, network traffic going to and from Azure, and I never remember, never remember which one's free, if it's incoming that's free and it's outgoing that costs money or vice versa. Um, but So that means that either your backups are going to be free going in or your restores are going to cost money. Uh, but the other thing that's really nasty with that is just that your restores will take longer pulling them down from the cloud. Rather than backing up, oh, and of course, if your network connectivity blips during the course of your backup, then your backups fail. SQL Server doesn't have great retry uh, things. It'll start again halfway through a backup. If you want to sync your backups to the cloud, and I love doing that, if you want to sync your backups to the cloud, use a file sync tool rather than trying to go directly from SQL Server up to the cloud. If you want to learn more about that, uh, search for Brent Ozar Faux Pas, F-A-U-X-P-A-A-S. Brent Ozar Faux Pas, as in platform as a service. And I have a blog post where I did back up to uh, Azure Blob Storage and uh, had to uh, uh, performance benchmark tune it uh, for a client that needed really fast backup and restore. Uh, and we'll do one more. Don't bother asking asks. Hi, Brent. Love your work. A friend improved a slow running vendor query for the business by using an index. The query now completes in a fraction of the time, but the query optimizer now says reason for early termination is timeout instead of good enough. Is this fix suboptimal? It sounds like you're at a great point to attend my Mastering Query Tuning classes. In my Mastering Query Tuning classes, we talk about what that uh, message means. And then I also talk about the right ways to measure your query. In the vi literally the very first mo uh, module of the Mastering Query Tuning class covers the answer to your question. And if you have the recorded class season pass with mastering uh, videos, go watch just the first module and watch the takeaways at the end. All right, that's the last question we're going to do because it is sunset here and I want to show you the sun going down. So there you go. Uh, so that is the uh, sun going down there in Cabo San Lucas. The waves are a little bit more peaky over there because uh, it just breaks a little bit differently. I'll zoom in some so that you can see it a little better there. Yeah, so there you go. That's why you're not supposed to get in the water down here. Uh, so it's Friday night, 6 p.m., 6, 12 p.m. in uh, Cabo San Lucas. I am, ooh, look at that water. Oh, man. Boy, I timed that kind of perfectly. I, I just about needed to get up. I think the tide's coming up here. Um, I am going to go get myself some dinner, and then I'm flying back to the States tomorrow. I'm going to Vegas for a week to, uh, well, first stopping in San Diego to pick up some stuff, and then going to Vegas for a week to hit some of my favorite restaurants. It's been a while since uh, I've been out there. And then uh, coming back down here to Cabo, before going back out to SQL Bits, uh, hitting to SQL Bits in London. Really excited about that. Have a one day workshop. There's still space left in my workshop. Uh, it's available both in person and online. 
And uh, if you're going in person, I'd love to see you in London. So I will uh, leave you here with the sun going down. Zoom in, zoom in a little bit more here, just so that you can see it. And uh, y'all have a good night.